Anyway, hey, one of the songs that they sang tonight talked about the glory of the Lord, and that's what my message is on. The Lord's really, really been on me about the glory and, I, and the glory of God, and I'm still in the process of really studying it out. I want to share some of these uh, passages of Scripture with you, really a concept that I believe that the Lord's been working because He's just unfolding it for me. And many of you have heard me say that, that there was a time, I don't know, it, it seems like it's been about two months now when I was preaching a message. And uh, we were talking about the spies and how Moses had sent the spies into the land. And uh, the 12 spies went into the land and they saw the giants in the land. And whenever they came back to give the report, that 10 of the spies were fearful. And they said, we were grasshoppers in the eyes of the giants. We thought ourselves to be grasshoppers. And they gave a bad report. But Joshua and Caleb said, no, those giants are bred for us. If God be for us, who can be against us? Amen. And then the people wanted to stone them. And in the end, I, I read the scripture. It comes out of Numbers 14, 21. And in the scripture, it says, as surely as I live, this was God speaking to Moses. As surely as I live, the glory of the Lord will fill the earth. Amen. And so since and when I spoke it, it was like it wasn't even really an emphatic point of my message. But when I spoke it, it was like. The Lord really kind of hit me with it, and, and I have not been able to get it out of my mind. It, it continues to, you know, really grab a hold of my thought process as I'm studying. And I feel like the Lord now is just kind of like really opening it up at another level. So, again, Holy Spirit, I need your help to be able to explain these concepts that you've re revealed to me, Lord. I pray that you would help me to communicate it. Properly, Lord, that the people would be able to be blessed in the name of Jesus. Amen. So just to, just a little bit about the glory of the Lord. There's a lot of different things that we could say about the glory, and I'm not. This is not all inclusive. Really, truly, I think this could go on for about four weeks at least um, at different levels. But the glory of the Lord is really directly associated with God's presence. When God's glory and presence enters into the natural realm, it changes things. Amen. It changes the atmosphere. Miracles. Amen. Are ready to take place. Amen. And I'm talking about miracles. Look, and there's levels to even miracles, right? I mean, we talk about the the, the lame man at the, at the gate, beautiful, whenever Peter said, Look at me, I, silver and gold have I none, but such as I have, give I thee in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. Get up and walk and picked him up, amen. And he started to walk. Praise God. I laid a hand, I laid hands on the lady at the clinic the other day, and her legs were, and I was just hoping, oh, let's see it right now, Lord. It didn't manifest right there, but I told him when it does, praise God, you come back and you let me know. Because I believe God's gonna heal these legs in the name of Jesus. And I believe it, amen. And and so, but there, but there's differing levels, amen, of of, of miracles, meaning they sometimes they happen right then and there, but but we can never be restrained from believing God to do a miracle, Amen. and especially if He puts it on our heart to pray for someone just because we're concerned that it's not going to happen right then and there. Because there's story after story, testimony after testimony about the fact that God didn't necessarily do it right then and there, but then He did it, you know, days later, weeks later, or whatever the case, and. He's a miracle working God. Amen? Amen. And so when God's glory and his presence enters the natural realm, it affects the atmosphere. It affects the people. It changes situations and circumstances. Uh, one of the first things that I would like to say, if you could put Leviticus 9, and this would be in the King James, if you don't mind. Leviticus 9, 6 and 7. I might use, I got Sandy to put the NASB version up there too. Y'all know me. I'm mostly a King James God. But every now and then, some of these Newer translations, and when I say newer translations, I'm very picky about what I use, but the literal newer translations like the NASB, every now and then the ESV. So we might talk a little uh, out of the NASB a little bit tonight, but in Leviticus 9, 6 and 7, it says, all right, here we go. And Moses said, this is the thing which the Lord commanded that you should do, and the glory of the Lord shall appear unto you. And Moses said unto Aaron, go unto the altar and offer your sin offering and your burnt offering and make an atonement for yourself and for the people and offer the offering of the people and make an atonement for them as the Lord commanded. Amen. And so in this passage of scripture, what I wanted you to see is that in the Old Testament, it, in these two verses, the glory of God was directly related to the sacrifice. 
The altar was directly connected to the sacrifice. And we understand if you read the whole of the scripture that the sacrificial system were types and shadows of the sacrifice of Jesus Hallelujah. that was to come. Amen. And so if you go through the whole chapter, really about 17 verses, I counted it earlier. He goes through and he begins to explain exactly how they offered up those offerings. And then just like God told Moses, the glory of God showed up. And what I wanted to say about that is this, is that God's glory shows up for the people on earth that carry the sacrifice. Let me go ahead and explain that to you a little bit better. There was all kinds of nation groups that were existing during the time frame that this story takes place. But there was only one nation called Israel. There was only one people that God had pulled out of Egypt and given them the sacrificial system, which was a type and shadow of Jesus that was to come. And they were the ones that were offering sacrifices to Yahweh, the God who had made them a nation when he called Abraham out. Okay, if you don't know the story of Abraham, there used to be a time when there was no nation called Israel. I'm going to start talking to everybody like we have never read the Bible. Y'all okay with that? And I'm just going to explain it. Because sometimes when people are like, I don't, I, I let a lady, I, I, I believe I led a lady to the Lord at the clinic the other night too. Amen. <laughs> Amen. Praise God. I pray the truth. And I said, you can come visit at our church. Some people complain. They say that I teach too deep a stuff. But did you take algebra in high school? Yes, I did. You learned X equals 2? Yes, I did. Well, hallelujah, you have the capacity to learn. If you can find out that letters equal numbers, you can learn, my friend. So anyway, there was a man named Abraham. There was no nation called Israel. And God called that man out and said, I'm going to make a nation out of you. He had a son named Isaac. Isaac had twins. One of them's name was Jacob. His name was changed to Israel. The 12 tribes of Israel got exited out of Egypt and became a nation. Hallelujah. And you can read about them on the news today. Lord help Israel right now. Yes. It's in the Bible. It's in the Bible that God called a man named Abraham out and it's on the news yeah. and so it's real is what I'm trying to tell you I know you know it's real you got Jesus in your heart but some people are still having a hard time believing yeah. and God called these people and there's all kind of nations around them and they don't know Yahweh unless guess what there's people today and the question is are we carrying the sacrifice with us because there's a whole world out there that is not embracing Jesus they're rejecting Jesus. Come on, somebody. Help me out here. I come tonight to tell you the truth. There's a whole slew of people upon this earth that even say that they love Jesus. But they're not living the life of the cross. By the grace of God, Lord, help us to learn what it means to live the life of the cross. Because most of the time we're clinging to our own life. Instead of releasing it into the hands of God. And every single time I ever cling to my old life. It only left me empty. It left me miserable. It left me in more pain. More trouble. Oh Lord. Yes, amen. You know I got a word the other night. I shouldn't even do this because I got so much scripture. I, when I went to that little thing at Cornerstone. I got The first word I got was. You're not called to be. You're not called to be a. A seed, a seed sower, you're called to be a tree planter. All right? And hallelujah, I told you all that the other day. Then, then he also told me this. He said, you're not even a preacher. You're a witness. And I was like, you know what? Praise God. I'm a witness. I always been a witness. It's by the grace of God. What's yes. the Lord change me? But I'm a witness that also gets to stand behind the pulpit. <laughs> and everywhere I want to go, I want to be a witness. Amen. Praise God. Everywhere I go, I want to be a witness. But I was going to say this. I said I wasn't always a witness. And I know this. I know that God showed up in the midst of a life that was broken, busted, and disgusted. And how long does it take the Lord to convince us that every time we make a decision to go back to the old ways, to go back to Egypt, to go back to the old life, we're only digging a deeper pit for ourselves and making it harder for ourselves to get up. And there's what seems impossible with what is impossible with man, with man is there's nothing for God. He shows up and he does miracles. And he'll do miracles in your life. Amen. He'll change you. I believe that with all of my heart. The seed of the gospel will enter into your heart and it'll change you. And if you'll respond to it and move 
towards the truth of God's word instead of moving towards the lies of the enemy. God said he's a liar. He told the Pharisees that he said, your father is the devil. You're a liar. He's a liar. He's been a liar from the beginning. And everything that he says is a lie. You can't believe the devil. He's not your friend. The devil is not your friend. And, and, and so going back to, the, I'm, I'm talking about the message of the cross. That, that God's people carry the sacrifice with them. And the sacrifice of Jesus is the message of the cross. And not just to get into the kingdom of God. See, the Bible says flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God. That's why this old man, and I want to talk to you about the glory tonight. But that's what we're talking about. Because like Solomon said when he was here, we're moving from glory to glory to glory. And I have some of that, that passage in my text tonight. Amen. What I need you to know, though, is that it starts at the foot of the cross. And it continues through the cross. Because, see, Matt Abair needs to keep on dying so that Jesus in him can keep on living. Hallelujah. So that there be more of Jesus and less of Matt. Because if you got more Matt and less Jesus, you don't have anything good. Amen. 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 And that's the truth. Look at Colossians chapter 1. And we're going to look at these four verses. Because I wanted to talk to you a little bit about the cross before I moved on to the glory. Because... You can't have one without the other. Amen. Amen. Colossians chapter 1 verse 10. It says that you might walk worthy of the Lord. Hallelujah. That you might walk worthy of the Lord unto all pleasing. Being fruitful in every good work. And increasing in the knowledge of God. There's so much there. But let's just look at walk worthy of the Lord. Just for a second. What does that even mean? Well listen. Whenever you now have given your life to Christ. Amen. And, and you begin to profess Christianity. Listen, you don't have to raise your hand because I don't want to make you feel weird. But in this room, I would ask the question, has, has anybody ever told another human being that they were a Christian and that they love Jesus? Okay. And I know that many of you have, maybe even all of you. Well, I just want to make the point that there's times in Matt Abear's life, Pastor Matt, Preacher Matt, Witness Matt, whatever you want to call him. There's been times in his life where even though he was telling people he was a Christian, he wasn't walking worthy. He wasn't walking worthy of the call. But this is the truth is that God has given us the equipment that we need to be able to walk worthy. So I want to encourage you with that tonight. I've done it before. You've done it before. But let us not believe the lies of the devil. Let us believe the truth of God's word that wants to encourage us and remind us that we can walk worthy. He says in verse 11, strengthened with all might according to his glorious Power connected to the power is his glory, connected to the glory is his power, and to all patience and long suffering with joyfulness. Now, look at this in verse 12. He says, Giving thanks unto the Father which has made us meet. In newer translations, the word is qualified. God the Father has made us qualified to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in light. God the Father has a plan. And if we will follow the plan, we become qualified to be part of what it is that he's doing on the earth. Amen. Who has delivered us. That word delivered means to be rescued. He's delivered us from the power of darkness and he's translated us. That word means to be transferred from one place to another. He's translated us into the kingdom of his dear son. So I don't know where you were last week. I don't know where you were last year. But you're not there right now. Hallelujah. You're in another place right now. Praise God. And spiritually, I want to encourage you to make sure you don't go back where you were last week. Spiritually, I want to encourage you to understand what the word of God says. That you've been translated from the kingdom of darkness. From the dominion of darkness. Into the kingdom of his dear son, which is light. Hallelujah. You've been translated. Well, how did that happen, preacher? When you heard the gospel and you said, yes, by faith, Jesus died on the cross for your sin. He paid the penalty for your sin. And when you said yes to the gospel, hallelujah, in the mind of God, the old man that you were, the Holy Spirit took you. I'm talking about, listen, 
Even if you ain't never been baptized in water, if you are truly saved, you're truly saved. You understand right. that? Water baptism is an outward sign of an inner work that has already taken place. If you have truly placed your faith in Christ, and if you have done that, the Bible says the Holy Spirit took you from this place of darkness and translated you, put you in Jesus. Hallelujah. And in the mind of God, you were nailed with him to the cross. I said it recently. I know I'm a repetitive preacher. He hit the rewind button. But 2,000 years ago, you were in him, with him, on the cross, and you died with him. That's Romans chapter 6. That's Galatians chapter 2, verse 20. And you were buried with him in the tomb. Hallelujah. And just as he was raised from the dead, you too should walk in newness of life. New life. Yes. Old yes. things passed away. All things Amen. have become new. A new creation. Yes. Amen. Oh, we got to start believing the truth and quit believing the lies of the devil. It ain't really that good going back to Egypt, Christian. Come on, somebody. Help me out. Y'all know what I'm talking about. Amen. Verse 14. In whom we have redemption. How did all this take place? You know what the word redemption means? Deliverance or release by payment. Mm -hmm. You couldn't pay it. That's right. Even if you got a good little chunk of change in your bank account, you couldn't afford this. Because mm -hmm. you see, this cost right here was through his blood. <laughs> Even the forgiveness of sins. This is the most expensive yes. thing the world has ever seen. The sinless blood yes. of God's Son. Hallelujah. See, the people that carry the sacrifice have access to the glory of God. I want you to know that. You have access to the glory of God. You have access to the presence of God. In the song, it actually said, The veil is torn, the doors fling wide. I see glory as I come inside the throne room. We have access yes. to the glory of God. Amen. It's a privilege, yes. my friend. Yes. Hallelujah. That's a privilege. Yes. That's why I was on my face like, Lord, what a privilege yes. to, to know you, to serve you. We take stuff for granted. I was repenting, Lord, forgive me. For every time I've complained, Lord, forgive me for wasting your time, Lord. Forgive me for the times as a Christian I acted in the flame. Lord, forgive me yeah. that I don't appreciate you more than I do. Oh, Lord, help me. I don't know if you feel the same way, but boy, I tell you, I feel that. All right, praise God. The glory of God is associated with the splendor and the brightness of God. In the Old Testament, the glory was physical and very dramatic. Today, it's still that way when I told you earlier about signs and wonders and miracles. Amen. The glory is associated with his presence. And when it's released, it is felt. Amen. It changes things. Amen. Even if it's not as dramatic as a true miracle, when his presence is released, his glory is released. And when his glory is released, it has an effect Amen. in the natural realm. And it affects people around it. Amen. In the Old Testament, it often took the form of a cloud. And sometimes it was associated with fire. Amen. It was a pillar of cloud by, by day and a pillar of fire by night. But also connected to Ezekiel, the, the book of Ezekiel, it's connected to the cherubim. And the cherubim, there was fire in the midst of the cherubim. Maybe you don't know what, what is a cherubim? Well, it's a type of an angel. And we won't get into it tonight, but Lucifer was a cherubim. All right. And so, but what I want you to know is in the book of Ezekiel, it talks about the cherubim and that they're associated with the throne of God. They're associated with the, with the presence of God and that there's fire rolling amongst the cherubim. It talks about that in Ezekiel in multiple spots. Simply stated, the glory of God is the presence of the Lord and where the presence of the Lord is. I want you to know tonight there is freedom, there is liberty, there is power, amen. And when a person spends time, I dare you, I dare you to spend time in his presence. Because when a person spends time in the presence of God, hallelujah, he's affected by the glory of God. Might not happen all at once. We just, want, we just want to snap our fingers and the Lord show up. But I'm here to tell you right now, you start making a practice of seeking the face of God and you will experience his presence and his presence will show up and it will start to have an effect on your life. Amen. Amen. When a person spends time, they're affected by the glory of God. And then when you start spending time with the, with the Lord, the glory of God 
that's been on you, in you. How, oh, it's in you, by the way. I want you to know that. I'm going to prove it to you in the scripture. The glory of God is in you, my friend. That's right. I don't even think I told y'all really the beginning of the visual that I had. The first thing the Lord told me was you're getting a promotion. Hallelujah. You're getting a promotion. But he wasn't talking about on this earth. Do you understand? Because as soon as I said it's a privilege to know you and to serve you, he said you're getting a promotion one day. And then it went into the vision that I saw. And what I'm trying to tell you tonight is that if you believe what I'm trying to talk to you about in this book, you're going to get a promotion, my friend. It's real. There's something on the other side of the veil. Hallelujah. And we're going to spend an eternity with God if we truly have gone the way of the cross. And this old stinky life full of pain, heartache, and sorrow is not worth it to keep you on the wrong side of the deal. It's time for us to get our promotion. My Amen. Yes. Hallelujah. I had a question in my message in my notes. What was removed from Adam to make him realize that he was naked? And you know, you really can't prove this. I've been reading about this for many, many years. Most scholars believe that it was the glory of God. All right, now I'm going to go backwards. I'm going to go all the way to the book of Revelation. We're going to work our way back. We're going to start deconstructing some stuff to try to make the point that I'm trying to make to you, okay? But what was it about Adam that realized after the fall that something had changed significantly and made him want to cover himself up, by the way? I hope you're not a mason watching our video or in this place. I've got another revelation that has nothing to do with this message but in my studies I had never seen this before when they fell and the glory of God I believe the glory of God left them and they realized they were naked what they covered themselves with an apron a loincloth you ever seen pictures of masons have you, ever, you never have okay well you google that later and you get back with me that is the I never saw that before and I'm over here writing books about oh I wrote a book about that and never even saw that how they cover themselves in that area with a loincloth, and it's got the G thing on it that supposedly stands for God. Anyway, that's not what I wanted to preach to you about. Amen. It's just something to think about. Amen? So what that means is, is that they believe that that's the right covering. Okay, you'll, you'll catch that. All right, praise <laughs> Let's keep it. You do know masons make bricks. Yeah. And, and you do know that at the Tower of Babel they made bricks. And you do know at the Tower of Babel, they were making their own city for their own name and for their own purposes. Yes. And they did not have God in the midst of their civilization. Yes. And you do know that was the first attempt at a new world order. And you do know on the American dollar bill, there's a pyramid with the eye of horse. It's got little tiny bricks. And you do understand that masons lay, make and lay bricks. Yeah. And they make cities. And they make, okay, just want to make sure y'all knew that. All right, that's something, but I didn't want to get into that. I want to talk about the glory. Amen? Amen. I want to talk about the glory. I want to talk about God. Amen? All right. So let's work backwards a little bit. But in Revelation chapter 21, verses 22 through 23, we're going to use the King James Version on this. It says, And I saw no temple therein, for the Lord God Almighty and the Lamb are the temple of it, and the city had no need of the sun, neither the moon to shine in it, for the glory of God did lighten it, and the Lamb is the light thereof. Amen. The glory of God emanating out of the city of God, praise God, is the light thereof. Amen. Go to John chapter 1 verse 4 real quick. I want to show you a lot of scripture tonight. If that's okay. You do like preachers that use the Bible. Every yes. now, right? Amen. That's good. John chapter 1 verse 4 says this. In him was life and the life was the light of men. Think about that. I want, to, I want to say something about that in a second. But look, in him was life and the life was the light of men. Look at verse 5. And the light shines in the darkness and the darkness comprehended it not. That's what the King James Version says. You don't have to switch over. I'm just going to tell you. Some other translations say, and the darkness could not overcome it. See, darkness can't understand it. And... Darkness sure can't lay hold of it and it cannot overcome or defeat it. Darkness can't, if it doesn't understand it, it can't. See, as a human being, God has given us 
a level of intellect that regular animals don't have. I don't care how smart animals are, they're not. What I'm trying to say is this, you don't want to get squared off with a tiger in the jungle at the wrong time in the wrong place. But if you know he's there and you have time to sit back and to methodically think about it, God gave you enough intellect, or some people anyway, to be able to come up with a contraption to where they can overcome this powerful animal through their intellect. Darkness cannot apprehend it and it can't overcome it. Gee, God the Father sent light into the midst of the darkness and the darkness can't do anything about it. Do you not believe that if Satan could stop it, he wouldn't have already stopped it? Do you not believe as much as the world hates the word of God, as much as the world hates our Jesus, do you not believe for one second that if darkness could stop it, that they wouldn't have already gotten rid of the Bible? Yes, they would have gotten rid of the Bible, but they can't get rid of the Bible because this is God's planet. This is God's earth, even though sometimes it doesn't look like it. I'm here to tell you, he's looking for some Joshua and Caleb, amen, that'll bring the glory of the Lord and help the earth be filled with the glory of God. Hallelujah. Because it's going to happen. The question is, will you join in? The question is, will I join in? The question is, will we endure until the end? The question is, or are we going to quit? Because People don't like us, people don't, or people don't like the way Pastor Matt does things, or, you know, whatever. It's just like, well, golly, I'm going to go somewhere else and do something else. No, 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 no. No. I'm going to stick to it. Amen? Amen? Praise God. I like this little verse, though, here. And you know how you can turn to it if you want, but verse 8. He was not, that's talking about John the Baptist. He was not the light, but was sent to bear witness of the light. Amen? You're not the light. I mean, well, that's not exactly true. Jesus said, you are the light of the world. Because he translated his light into you. Sure. Amen? So now you're the light of the world. Jesus put his light in you. Amen? And let, let all men see your works that they might glorify your Father in heaven. Praise God. But John the Baptist wasn't the light. People thought he was the light. Or they questioned whether he was the Messiah. But he came to bear witness of the light. Verse 9 says this. That was the true light. Jesus. Which lighteth every man that comes into the world. But I want you to imagine, and I said this to the Sunday Night Bible Study Group, the world full of darkness. Darkness prevailing on the face of the earth. And then like a shooting star, I might have even said this Sunday in my message, I can't remember, like a shooting star, the, light, the life of God comes into a world that's full of death and darkness. He sends Jesus Born of a virgin, of incorruptible seed, and now that seed starts to spread. The picture that I had was a picture of the earth from one of those space shows. But it was a particular picture that actually showed the area of like Canada, Toronto, and all that. And you could see the lights at nighttime emanating from the city. But in my mind, what I want you to imagine is that God up there in heaven looking and every single, look at what it says. That was the true light which lighteth every man. When every time a human being truly accepts Jesus Christ, boom, their light comes on. And I just imagine God up there in heaven seeing it. Look, there's another one, hallelujah. And I was thinking about captains on the ship because in this particular picture I had, maybe I'll show it to you Sunday morning before just so you can get a vision of it. In this picture I had, it just showed the landmass lighted, but I was like, well, that can't really be true. That's just sin. But just imagine on, there were ships in the ocean. And from God's perspective, on this ship right here, there might be two lights on that ship because you've got two of his people on that one. And then on this ship over here, you've got three. And on that ship over there, he's got four. And every place, there's a believer all across the globe, their light has been turned on. And God the Father sees the light and it's connected to the glory because it's connected to the truth because it's connected to the presence of God. Yes. And God said, as surely as I live, the glory of the Lord will fill the earth. Yeah. See, those ten spies did not want to go into the land. They feared instead of having faith. But Joshua and Caleb, they said, no, we can do this. 
And at that time, God ended up blessing them. Amen. And there's a remnant of Israel that did it. And we talked about Naboth's vineyard on Sunday. And he said, I will not give you my inheritance. Amen. And God's looking for people like Naboth that will not give up their inheritance. And he's looking for people like Joshua and Caleb that will let their light shine before men that will glorify their father in heaven. Because as surely as he lives, his glory is going to fill this earth. And what we do on this side is going to affect the next side. Amen. Yes. In Philippians chapter 3 verse 21. It, it's just going to get better my friend. It, like this is just a taste of it. Well okay. I know. I, listen I understand that sometimes. <laughs> times are tough. I get that. We go through things. But we need to learn how to hold on to the Lord. Amen. I'm just telling you it's going to get better. You're going to get a promotion. The Lord wants me to tell you that tonight. You're going to get a promotion. Oh, hold okay. on. Amen. Has, has anybody ever gotten a promotion in their real job? Praise yes. God. Amen. Now, when you got your promotion at your real job, was it because you were a loafer? <laughs> I'm not talking about a shoe. <laughs> That's what they used to say back in the old days when I played football. Quit loafing, boy. My dad said, don't you be a loafer. You got to hustle. Now, they changed that word, too. It's not the same. You know, the old kind of hustle. Old school yeah. hustle. Get it, get it done. Get it done. That's right. So when you get a promotion at work, it's not because you're just laying around. It's because you're working hard. Amen. Working for the kingdom. Now, you can't work your way into the kingdom. Let's be clear about that. But you work because the Lord has asked us to work for him, to share the truth with others, that their light might be turned on, that God might be glorified because as surely as he lives. His glory is going to fill this earth. All right, but you're going to get a promotion. I want you to see this in Philippians chapter 3, verse 21. It says this, Who shall change our vile body, that it may be fashioned like unto his glorious body, according to the working whereby he is able even to subdue all things unto himself. The part I want you to focus on there is that he's going to change our vile body. Because our, our body, even though we're saved, it, our body is still corrupted from the fall. Amen. We don't have to be sick. I believe that the Lord wants to heal us. Amen. I believe he's already healed us. But nevertheless, should the Lord tarry, you are going to step into glory. Let's just put it this way. You will step into glory one way or the other. Amen. You'll either go like, Eli like Elijah in the chariot, hallelujah, for, with the rapture, or you will go the, break, the way of the grave. That's right. If the Lord tarries. Amen. Um, I'm, so, so with that said, though the, the body's vile because of the fall, the body's uh, corrupted because of the fall, but it's going to be fashioned like unto his glorious body. Now, I want you to know you're, we're not Mormons. <laughs> no reason I say that is Mormons believe that you're going to become a, a god and you'll get your own planet. <laughs> we're not going to become God. But we're going to receive a glorified body like Jesus has. Amen. And so we're going to be like him. We're supposed to be like him right now. Amen. The spirit of God in us, the life of God in us. Paul said that, see how I labor and pain till Christ be formed in you. Amen. See, Jesus is supposed to be being formed in us. Yes. The countenance of our Lord is supposed to be emanating from us. Amen. All right. Let's look at 1 Corinthians 15. And we'll start at verse 35. I want to talk to you a little bit about the glorified body. Amen? <laughs> because we're talking about glory. Praise God. It says, and, and, and I felt like we, oh, let's go to the NASB on this if you could. <coughs> I like the way the NASB worded some of this. And so we're going to go to 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 35. And that way, if you have a King James Version, if you can see the screen, you'll be able to at least see where I'm reading. And listen, if I were you and you're not used to other translations, I would be comparing the two because that's what I do still whenever I use a different translation than the King James. So he says, but someone will say, how are the dead raised and with what kind of body do they come? So somebody's asking about the resurrection. What does the body look like? Right. He says, you fool. That, that which you sow does not come to life unless it dies. In other words, when you stick a seed in the ground, the thing has to die to its original form and the way that it looked so that it can become something else. Does that make sense? All right. And that which you sow, you do not sow the body which is to be, but a bare grain. So it's like what you put in the ground is not really what you expect to come out of the ground. You put in a seed, something else is coming up, perhaps of weed or of something else. But God gives it a body just as he wished, and to each of the seeds, a body of its own. All flesh is not the same flesh, 
But there's one flesh of men, another flesh of beasts, another flesh of birds, and another of fish. There are also heavenly bodies and earthly bodies. But the glory of the heavenly one is one, and the glory of the earthly is another. There's one glory of the sun, another glory of the moon, and another glory of the stars. For stars, for star differs from star in glory. So I put a little note in here. The sun having its own splendor and glory given to it by God releases its glory into the atmosphere. Then the moon receives the glory of the sun and reflects it outwardly so that its glory can be seen. But anyone that knows what's really up understands that the moon is a reflection of the sun. Amen. The moon is not the sun. It's not confused. It, it reflects the glory That's good. of the sun. Amen. So also is the resurrection of the dead, verse 42. It is sown a perishable body, but it is raised an imperishable body. Verse 43. It is sown in dishonor. It is raised in glory. Hallelujah. It is sown in weakness. It is raised in power. Verse 44, it is sown a natural body. It is raised a spiritual body. If there is a natural body, there is also a spiritual body. The Apostle Paul wants you to know, the Lord revealed to him that there is going to be a resurrection from the dead. And you are going to receive yes. a glorified body if you are a true believer in Christ. Hallelujah. And if you're not, maybe you're watching on video. Because I believe everybody in this place is born again tonight. But maybe you're watching the video and you're not born again. You need to live Lift your hands in the air and you need to call on the name of Jesus and you need to ask forgiveness of your sin because he loves you and he died for you. And if you will receive him as your Lord and Savior and ask forgiveness, the Holy Spirit will come to live on the inside of you and he will change you and you too can receive a glorified body. Amen. Praise God. You're going to get a promotion. It's a beautiful thing. It's a privilege to serve the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. Do you believe that tonight? Yes. Well, we need to quit. <laughs> We need to quit acting the fool, friend. Come on. Is it okay if I say that? I don't know. I got an encouraging message tonight. Don't, don't mess it up, Pastor. It's a privilege to serve him. That's right. And this is the thing. He's given us the grace that we need to live right. Yes. Because of the cross, there's a release of supernatural power from the person of the Holy Spirit. Hallelujah. It's called sanctification. It's not you just trying to clean yourself up, following a bunch of rules and regulations, how many times you go to church, how many pieces of ministry you're involved in, how much you preach the gospel, how much you witness, how many times you pray for people. That No, sanctification is you understand you are a new creation in Christ, that Jesus died to set you free. And if you will keep your eyes focused squarely on him, hallelujah, the whole, for hope, for strength, for power, for righteousness, he's your righteousness. You've been clothed in the righteousness of Jesus. And if you will keep your faith focused on that, the Holy Spirit will release the power of heaven and will give you the strength you need to live right and to bring glory to your God. Yes. That's the problem with a lot of Christians. They've been sitting under a works-based message. Mm. They've been putting their faith in everything but Jesus Christ. And what he did for them at the cross. They've been frustrating the grace of God according to the letter to the Galatian church. And instead of frustrating the grace of God, we just need to, re we just need to receive. Yes. I'm telling you right now, for 12 years as a Christian, I lived in failure. Am I proud of it? No. But 12 years as a Christian, I lived in failure. Man, I used to dip so much skull, my lip would be all wrinkled up. I had sores on my gums and my lip. I wake up every morning looking at my lip like, oh, Lord. I went to the oral surgeon so many times. Like, and he was, by that time, he was my friend because he had first met me in, in the hospital. He's like, son, you're okay, but you need to quit. And then finally, hallelujah, when I came to the breaking point and I started to realize in the gospel that it was already done and I started to believe it. Does it always happen even? No, just like the healing doesn't always happen the same day. But listen to me, my friend. It's done. It's paid for. And if sanctification is paid for, if salvation is paid for, hallelujah, our healing is paid for, our deliverance is paid for, we can put our hope in it. We can believe in it. It's done. Amen. And if we'll believe in the right thing, the Holy Spirit is pleased and he shows up and he gives us strength. Amen. 
So in verse 45, it says, so also it is written, the first man, Adam, became a living soul. The last Adam became a life-giving spirit. Praise God. However, the spiritual is not first, but the natural, then the spiritual. The first man is from the earth, earthy. The second man is from heaven. I, I really love this concept right here because the Lord showed me something many years ago. So I'm going to just throw it out there to you. Esau, I love this. So Esau, there were twins. Y'all know the story of Esau and Jacob? They're twins, right? So the first one comes out. This is, this is you can't make this stuff up. It is hot, huh? Y'all hot? Huh? Okay. Sabrina, me and Sabrina got horn on this thing. <laughs> so, so I, I shouldn't have gone down this rabbit trail, but I'm gonna. So Esau came out first. He's the not, he represents the natural birth. Did you know that his 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 name, the nation that bore his name, was called Edom? Y'all ever heard of that? Y'all read about Edom in the Bible? If you click on your Strong's in the Hebrew, you know what the word Edom means? Red. It's connected to the word Adam. You know what Adam means? Red. Why is Adam red? Because he came from the earth. You ever seen red dirt in Mississippi? He came from the, from the red dirt of the earth. Esau came out red and hairy. Esau sold his, his birthright for a bowl of red stew. He's the first birth and everything connected to him is red. Yet Jacob is the second birth. Just as the first one bore the image. Just as we bore the image of the earthy and our first birth and our natural birth we were born like our father Adam we will also bear the image of the heavenly because we received our second birth it's a supernatural birth hallelujah and we're going to get a promotion praise Amen. God Amen. as is the earthy so, are, so also are those who are earthy as is the heavenly so also are those who are heavenly I got a little so people who either are not saved or are led by the flesh instead of the spirit will act like sinful earthlings. Whereas those saved and led by the spirit will act like Jesus because he was always led by the spirit. And the scripture says that we're heavenly beings even now in that we are seated with him in heavenly places. Ephesians chapter 2 verse 6. We're in Christ. Yes. So listen, whenever I'm talking about sin too, let me just make this clear. Don't always think that we're talking about sins of addiction. Because sometimes we're talking about the way we treat one another. See, we don't talk about those enough. <laughs> because, I'm, But you got to, because anytime you're in a church, even, if it, even though it might be a small church, if you quit talking about sin, it might grow, right? I don't know if that's the problem, but this is the thing. Is that is this is that whenever whenever you're talking about sin, it's not just about the things that we do that are improper. And in reality, what, well, it is improper, but but the way that we treat other people. Yeah. Sometimes we walk around prideful. Sometimes we go behind our brother or sister's back and we gossip and slander. Sometimes we 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 go around and we and we, we repeat things that ought not be repeated, and it causes trouble, causes confusion and chaos in the kingdom of God. And God's not pleased with that. Yeah. Amen. And so when we're led by the spirit, we don't do that kind of stuff. And let me tell you why. Because it damages the kingdom. Jesus ain't never done that. Jesus didn't cause confusion in his in the kingdom of God. No. He might cause, he came to cause confusion in the kingdom of darkness. Yeah. Amen. All right. Well, you get the point. Amen. Just as we are born the image of the earthly, we will also, this is verse 49, we will also bear the image of the heavenly. Hallelujah. Yes. There's more glory to come. He's not done with us yet. Amen. All right. We're going to skip the rest of that. But then ultimately he starts talking about the rapture. So I want to try to share with you a little bit because we've got to give those kids a little bit of time. Okay. Y'all cool with that? <coughs> Just for a little longer. Exodus chapter 34 verses 29 through 35. And we can do this in the NAS too. So we'll start in verse 29. It came about, because we're talking about the glory, and we're talking about how the glory affects the atmosphere. We're talking about how the glory affects people, right? And in the Old Testament, it did that also. And we have the case of Moses right here. It says, it came about when Moses was coming down from Mount Sinai, and the two tablets of the testimony were in Moses' hand, as he was coming down from the mountain that Moses did not know that the skin of his face shone because of his speaking with him, talking about God. Verse 30. 
So when Aaron and all the sons of Israel saw Moses, behold, the skin of his face shone and they were afraid to come near him. Now, the reason I chose to use the NASB is because many times in the King James Version, I was left with the impression that the reason that Moses used the veil was so that the children of Israel wouldn't be scared of him. But Paul explains it to us in the letter to the Corinthian church that that's not why the veil was worn. The veil was worn because the glory was fading and the idea was that he didn't want them to really see that part of it, okay? So it says in verse 31, then Moses called to them and Aaron and all the rulers in the congregation returned to him and Moses spoke to them. Afterward, all the sons of Israel came near and he commanded them to do everything that the Lord had spoken to him on Mount Sinai. Verse 33, when Moses had finished speaking with them, he put a veil over his face. You see that in ASB. When Moses had finished speaking with them, he put a veil over his face. Can you click over to the King James right there? If you can, that'd be great. Verse 33 is what I wanted her, her to click over to. And if she can do that, I mean, this is her first time. She's doing a great job. Look at this. I wanted you to see this right here. I don't have my little pointy stick, so I'm not gonna. I'm not gonna try to go. But if y'all can, I don't know if y'all can see on video or not. You see that word "till" right there? And till Moses had done speaking with him, he put a veil on his face. That, that, how does that make it sound to you? Does it sound like he wore the veil till he was done speaking? Yeah. And till Moses had done speaking with them. He put a veil on his face. See, to me, that's kind of what I always interpret it, whether you didn't get it that way or not. But that word till right there in the King James is in italics. If you understand what the italics mean, it means that the translator inserted it there to try to help us to better understand it. But in the old language, in my opinion, to me anyway, it kind of confused me. But that's why I wanted to, you to read it. So the idea is, is that whenever he, so look at verse 34, go back to the NASB, I think it is. Yeah, the NASB, if you could. So we're going to go back to verse 34. It says, but when Moses went in before the Lord to speak with him, he would take off the veil. He's getting some of that glory. Amen. <laughs> Praise God. And until he came out and whenever he came out and spoke to the sons of Israel, what he had been commanded, the sons of Israel would see the face of Moses, that the skin of Moses, his face shone. So Moses would replace the veil over his face until he went in to speak with God. So he would, he would go talk to the Lord is what it looks like to me. His face would radiate the glory of God. He'd walk out. He'd talk to the children of Israel. And then after he was done talking to him, he'd put the veil on his face until he went back in to talk to God again. Because what was happening is, is that the glory was diminishing as the time went by. And we'll see that Paul... He actually verifies that for us. In Exodus chapter 34, I wanted you to see this about the glory real quick. He said in verse 10, Exodus 34, verse 10. I, want, I, want you, I wanted you to be able to see this concept right here. He says, and he said, behold, I make a covenant before all of the, thy people. I will do marvels such as have not been done in all the earth, nor in any nation. And all the people among which you are shall see the work of the Lord. For it is a terrible thing. Is that what it says? A terrible thing? Yeah. yeah. It is a terrible thing that I will do with thee. Verse 11, observe thou that which I command thee this day. Behold, I drive out before thee the Amorite and the Canaanite, the Hittite, the Perizzite, the Hivite, and the Jebusite. I want you to know this. God's glory will not remain forever in a polluted environment. That's right. See, God says, as surely as I live, the glory of the Lord will fill the earth. But as surely as we live right now, Adam delivered. That's what it says in Luke chapter 21. Satan said, these kingdoms and the glory of these kingdoms, they've been delivered to me. Who do you think gave them to him? It wasn't the Lord. No. See, the earth was created for man to live upon the earth and to have dominion and rule and authority over it. But whenever Adam fell, he delivered his power and authority over to the evil one. And now the nature of man has been changed. I can prove it to you. We're not going to go to it. But Genesis chapter 5 verse 3. It says after 130 years when Seth was born. Whose image was he born into? Adam's. After the fall. 
He's not, mankind is no longer, yes, in a sense we're still, we are, mankind is created in the image and likeness of God, but you've got to understand, now being born in Adam, we have been born with a sinful nature. And now whenever man is reproducing on the earth, he's not, he's not releasing God's glory for the most part. That's why God's got a people called after his name, a remnant. That are supposed to be living for him and, and serving him and allowing his light to shine before all men. But whenever mankind separate from God is reproducing, the parasite, the Hittite, the Jebusite, they're reproducing and they're putting wickedness in the midst of the land. The word of God says in Ezekiel chapter 8, we're not going to turn there, but it says there was an image of jealousy near the inner court and also the presence of the Lord was there. And he told Ezekiel, look at this son of man, look what they do to me. They're trying to drive me out of my own place. Because the glory of the Lord, and ultimately his glory left the temple in chapter 10. The glory of the Lord will not remain in a polluted environment forever. God is going to fix this problem that we have on the earth. Yeah. <laughs> He's going to do it. And we're going to get a promotion. And in the meantime, we need to work for the Lord. Amen. Praise God. He said to take heed that we don't make a covenant with the inhabitants of the earth. You don't even have to go there. I'm hustling up. We're giving the kids a little bit more time, but I'm hustling up. I want to, I want to close with a couple of scriptures. But look, he said, don't make a covenant with those Perizzites, Hittites, Amorites, Jebusites. Don't make a covenant with them. Don't become their bestie. That's right. You cannot become a bestie with somebody that's still living in the world and think you're going to serve the Lord your God. Yeah. It's not going to happen, especially if they do the old stuff you used to do. Amen. All right, I'm going to leave it at that. He says, but instead you shall destroy their altars, break down their images. Amen. All right. So let's go to 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 7. And we're going to take this and we're going to connect it to Moses. And we're just going to read through this. It says in verse 7, 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 7, it says, But if the ministration of death written and engraven in stones was glorious, so that the children of Israel could not steadfastly behold the face of Moses for the glory of his countenance, which glory was to be done away. How shall not the ministration of the spirit be rather glorious? For if the ministration of condemnation, because, you know, the law condemns us because nobody can keep the law other than Jesus. So if the ministration of condemnation, which is the law, is glorious, much more does the ministration of righteousness Exceed in glory. I'm reading out the King James. Y'all in the NA. I'm sorry. For even that which was made glorious <clears throat> had no glory in this respect by reason of the glory that excels. For if that which is done away was glorious, talking about the law, much more that which remains is glorious. Seeing then that we have such hope, we use great plainness of speech. Verse 13. And not as Moses, which put a veil over his face, that the children of Israel could not steadfastly look to the end of that which was abolished. You don't have to go back if you switch to the King James, but this is the NASB. 2 Corinthians 3.13. And are not like Moses who used to put a veil over his face so that the sons of Israel would not look intently at the end of what was fading away. So first of all, I'm not getting into Adam tonight, but again, I'm going to ask you the question. What did Adam lose when he fell? What made Adam want to cover up? Why is Moses covering his face as the glory is fading? You understand the point that I'm trying to make here. I want to, I want to give you three different spots in the scripture, and we don't necessarily have to turn to them, but you can go to this one here, verse 18 of this particular 2 Corinthians, where we are right now, verse 18. And it says, but we all have with open face, beholding as in a glass, the glory of the Lord, are changed. You see that word change right there? That word change right there. I'm going to write this on the board. And I've used this word a lot before when I've taught it. And so some of you may remember it. But this is how you would spell it if you were going to spell it in English. I'm not going to spell it in Greek because it takes me too long to have to think about it. Metamorph -io is how you would say that. All right? Which is where we get the word what? Tell me. Metamorphosis. You get the Metamorphosis. All right. So where we get the word metamorphosis, that word changed right there is the word metamorphio. 
in the Greek. This word is only used in three separate concepts, meaning it's used in two Gospels, if I'm not mistaken, maybe three, whenever what? Jesus was transfigured. All right? And it's used right here, and then it's used in a Romans passage, and I'm going to get to that in a second. But look what it says. We all with open face, beholding as in the glass with the Lord, glory of the Lord, are, ch are changed. I'm going to make up a word because I want to, because I like it. We, we, as in the glass, the glory of the Lord are metamorphed. That's not a real word, but I just made it because it's not, I, I like it. Are metamorphed into the same image from glory to glory, even as by the spirit of the Lord. The idea of metamorphosis, a change of the form or nature of a thing or person into a com completely different one, right? By natural or supernatural means. That's actually an American dictionary. The caterpillar has butterfly DNA in it, right? Christian has Jesus DNA in them. The caterpillar dies in a cocoon. Christian dies with Jesus on the cross and is buried in the tomb, right? The caterpillar comes back to life as a butterfly. The Christian resurrects to newness of life. But this is just a partial down payment. We are being changed from glory to glory into the same image as our Lord. Do, do you understand this, right? Amen. We should be able to understand. All right. So now we're going to go to Matthew chapter 17, verses 1 through 3. I want you to see this. Verse 1. After six days, Jesus took Peter, James, and John, his brother, and brought them up <clears throat> into a high mountain apart and was metamorphed before them. And his face did shine as the sun. The glory of God that was in him radiated out of him. Praise God. His face did shine as the sun and his raiment was white as light. And behold, there appeared unto them Moses and Elijah talking with him. Isn't that interesting how Moses shows up and he was the one that was wearing the veil. I never really looked at it like that before. And here Jesus is transfiguring and revealing the glory of God that's on the inside of him. Now, I'm, I'm actually going to close, I believe, with, uh, with two more scriptures. Here we go. Are you ready? This is... Uh, Romans chapter 12 verses 1 through 2 Romans chapter 12 verse 1 He says I beseech you Brethren by the mercies Of God that you present Your bodies a living Sacrifice holy Acceptable unto God which is Your reasonable service Boy there's a whole lot we could Unpack in there right I mean you're a sac You've been sacrificed with Christ yet You're alive it's, it's not even extravagant for you to offer your services unto the Lord. Amen. It's just a reasonable service. Praise God. We got to be, you know, sometimes we get frustrated whenever we, whenever we're working for the Lord and we feel like people don't appreciate us. And I know this to be true. If we let, if we let the devil whisper in our ear, we'll get frustrated. But I'm not, I'm not doing, I mean, I am. I am doing it for God's people, but I'm really doing it for him. And if you work in ministry, by the way, I encourage you to try, we need to try to find something for people to do, <laughs> praise God, but not, but, but, but being part of also bringing it outside the walls of the church. Because contrary to some popular belief, we're not trying to build a church. We're trying to build the kingdom of God. We're trying to plant seed, sow seed, water seed to see the gospel seed spread into people outside the walls of the church. Amen. All right. So look, and he goes on to say this. Be not conformed to this world, but be you metamorphed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Now, listen, I don't have time to preach on the renewed mind, but let's just look at this right here for a second. He's saying that there is a direct connection between metamorphosis and renewal of the mind. See, <clears throat> when you were born again. The Holy Spirit, and I know y'all been hearing me say this a lot lately, but the Holy Spirit became one with your spirit. You and the Holy Spirit are one. God is one with you in your spirit. The problem that we have is that our mind, and I'm not talking about psychology, and I'm not talking about existential meditation. I'm not talking about none of that. I'm not talking about humanism. I'm not talking about, no, I'm talking about the gospel. 
Our mind needs to line up with what the Word of God says. The Word of God says you're a new creation, then you're a new creation. The Word of God says old things have passed away, then all things have passed away. The Word of God says all things have been made new, then that means all things have been made new. The Word of God says that you no longer are so he said, you know what the word of God says? Such were some of you. Such were some of you. What kind of some of you were you? I don't know. You fill in the blank. Amen. I can tell you about me. I tell y'all about myself all the time. And I don't even ask y'all to go ahead and talk. Some of y'all did talk about it the other day, though. It was so good. Dude. When Amy gave her testimony, oh my gosh. I didn't even expect all that. It was so good. Praise God. And everybody's got a testimony in this place. And it's so powerful. So powerful. Praise God. Praise God. I would love to hear y'all's testimony. Amen. But this is what it says about the renewing of your mind. All right. This is the last scripture. Promise. John 17 verse 21. It says that they all may be one as thou, Father, are in me and I in thee. That they also may be one in us. That the world may believe that you have sent me. That is so powerful. Did you, did you see that? Look at that. That they. Who's they? You. Because Jesus said, I'm not just praying for these disciples right here. I'm praying for everybody that's going to believe because of what they said. So he's talking to you right here. That they all may be one. Talking about all of us one in Christ. That they all may be one as you, Father, are in me. And I in you. That they also may be one in us, that the world may believe that you have sent me. Do you realize that if we start acting like and believing that we're in Christ and Christ is in us and that we're folded up in the Father, hallelujah, we're going to start looking a whole lot different. But look at this in verse 22. This is really what I want you to see right here. Listen, I know I don't wore y'all out with a bunch of scripture, but when you leave tonight, this is what I want you to remember of tonight. You ready? Look at this. And the glory which you gave me. Hallelujah. I said the glory that you gave me, I have given to them that they may be one even as we are one. Jesus gave you his glory, praise God. When you got saved, the glory of God is resonant on the inside of you. Amen. You have God in you. You have God's glory in you. I don't know about you, but I'm ready to release some of this glory out there. Hallelujah. I'm ready to fill the earth with the glory of the Lord.